its darkness and light. The Word made flesh come down to earth. This next passage of scripture I'm going to read sounds even less like Christmas. It's really part of the story of King David. Listen, from 2 Samuel 7. Now when the king was settled into his house and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See, now I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Interesting little story. Life has settled down for King David. The Lord, the scripture says, has given him rest from all of his enemies around him. See, the enemies of Israel have been plentiful, but they have now been defeated. The battles and the struggles and the troubles, wherever David looked, now these are all behind him, at least for the present. And so David, in his unaccustomed leisure, David has time to build himself a house, a beautiful palace, a fine house, truly fit for a king built of the cedars of Lebanon. But David, looking around at his beautiful home, feels a little bit of shame living in such a fine palace, after all, when the ark of God is set up in a tent. A tent that the people of Israel had carried with them out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and into the promised land. They carried with them the ark of God in the tabernacle, in the tent. But this proved a very versatile way that God could be with the people on the move. But now they're settled. And so in this period of prolonged peace with with God's people settling down and then the king of Israel settling into his own fine home, it makes sense that God's dwelling place, God's dwelling place should be more permanent. And so David declares that he is going to build a house for the Lord. David shares this brilliant idea with his friend, the prophet Nathan. And Nathan agrees, get on with it, he tells David. God deserves a fine house. But that night, God comes to the prophet. That's what happens to prophets. They have to speak time and again for God. God speaks to Nathan in a dream and says, Hold on. I want you to go back and I want you to talk to the king. Who told you, who told David what I would like and what I would not like? What makes you think that I want a house, God says. 
And what ensues is a theological discussion between God and Nathan, one which continues even today some 3,000 years later. And the question is this, where is God? Where does God reside? I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. People ask me from time to time that very same question. It's usually in the form of, tell me, where is God? And the times that I'm asked that question usually come in the hard times, the painful times, the times of doubt and grief and despair. Pastor, tell me, where's God? It becomes a very important question in those anguished times because, you see, to ask the question, where is God, usually is another way of asking, so why isn't God here with us now? And if God is here, if you dare say that God is here with us, then why doesn't God do something to stop these terrible things from happening? Where is God? It would be convenient if God had a street address where we could just drop by whenever we were in need, asking for God to come with God's strength, God's mercy, God's presence. Better yet, an address from which we could summon God like a call to 911 to come to our aid whenever we're in need. Where is God? Where can we find God? God tells Nathan that he is to turn around and tell the king that he doesn't need a house. God doesn't desire a house. Tell David three things, God tells Nathan. These are three things that I believe speak to our question about where God dwells even today. First, God says, I've never lived in a house, not ever, not since the day I brought the people out of Egypt all the way to this very day. A tent has suited me just fine. Thank you, God tells Nathan. God has been on the move and among God's people always. And a God on the move can come into our lives at the most unexpected, unpredictable, and inconvenient times. God can take our failures, our pain, our disappointment. And help us grow and prosper. Not in every situation, not at every time. God cannot be that predictable. <laughs> the only certainty is that God moves freely and in surprising ways. And that brings us to the second thing that God wants Nathan to tell the king. He says, the Lord of hosts tells the king. I took you, meaning David, from a pasture, from following the sheep, to be the prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you ever since, wherever you went. See, God wants David to recognize that David has become a little bit forgetful. No structure could possibly make God more present than what God already has been. I've been with you wherever you went. Hear it? And then God tells Nathan to say one more thing. The Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord will make you into a house. Now that's a turn of events. David thought he was going to build a house for God, but God turns David's desire around and says, no, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to make you a house. But I want you to notice the play on words. God doesn't plan on building David a house. David, remember, already has a pretty grand one built out of the, the cedars of Lebanon. No, God is going to build David into a house. I will make you, God says, I will make you a house. Hear it? I will make David into a house and there will be children and family and descendants and by extension there will be a tribe, a nation, a people of Israel, the whole people of God. 
and the faithful people of God will forever be known as the house of David. You ever heard that phrase? That's where it comes from. The people of God will be known as the house of David. The faithful people of God, the only real house that the Lord ever needs. Now back to our question for today. So where is God when there's trouble? Where does God dwell? Well, don't you see? God is in the house. The house of God's own making. God dwells in the people of God. For example, how is it that you know that God is present with you today if not for the people of God? This Christmas will be once again reminded that God, especially in the sending of His Son Jesus, continues to take up residence in the people of God who make room for Him. How familiar then those words from John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then that Word became flesh and dwelled in us. And we have seen His glory. God's love comes down the night that the babe of Bethlehem is born. But God's love continues to come down and dwell in the people of God so that God's love is made real. In Jesus, God's home has been where it has always been. In the people of God. Now, if you wonder what that looks like, if you wonder how that works, I want you to think about the people who have touched you, who have helped you, who have lifted you, who have carried you, who have listened to you and strengthened you, who has made God's love real for you in the most difficult moments of your own lives. <coughs> Whenever someone is experiencing the worst moments of their life and they ask, where is God? Inevitably, I will hear that very same person talk about the people who helped them get through. The very people who reached out to them in love. And that, of course, is where God is. God is in God's people who carry the burdens and who offer help and support and care. You know that commercial, that commercial from a certain insurance company where the bald guy says, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two, right? You know that one? <laughs> Well, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. I know where God lives because I've seen where God resides. I've seen God in a nursing home. As a husband sits by his wife's bed holding her hand during their last moments together on this earth. And I've seen God in a mother as she comforts a frightened child in the aftermath of a horrible night of chaos. And I've seen God in a woman patiently guiding her husband whose mind has been stolen by dementia. And I've seen God. I've seen God working with people to restore families and neighborhoods that have been displaced by flood and storm. I've seen God in the faces of those who reach out to help resettle refugees fleeing for their lives. I've seen God because I've seen the people of God reaching out with the love of God. And I know another thing. You've seen God too. You've seen God in the faces and the eyes of your neighbors and your family and your church friends. That's what Emmanuel is. That's the Emmanuel that we read about, that we pray about, that we sing about all through this season. That is Emmanuel, God with us. <laughs> That's what the incarnation means, after all. 
God is in the house. Huh? God is in the house. God's love came down at Christmas. God's love became real at Christmas and dwells in us still today. The people of God, for all the people of earth, may God be praised.